Hello, hello, and hi, 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 and welcome to another edition of Things We Said Today, a talk show podcast on the Beatles. We talk about anything we feel like where the group is concerned, their years together, the solo years, the songs, the albums, what's going on today, whatever comes to mind, we cover it here on this show. And in particular, on this show, we're going to be exploring the brand new box set from John Lennon on Mind Games, which came out on July the 12th. We're going to talk in detail about many of the features on the album. There were six discs, if you're talking about CDs, plus bonus tracks. And we have a special guest that we will bring on in just a few moments. But first, let me introduce to you my uh, other two co-hosts of the show. First of all, we have Darren DeVivo, who has been a veteran (laughs) (laughs) and uh we're all veterans here in the new york area on uh radio station wfuv it's been there for 40 plus years now she's done a lot of great work there interviewed many people done beetle specials there and has been a part of our show for several years now hello darren hello ken hi everybody and hello alan okay and alan cozen is also with us you know him for that marvelous book that he collaborated with, with Adrian Sinclair, volume one in a series of, uh, there might be like 120 of them, I've been told, yeah. of uh, the McCartney legacy. And he's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. He's a freelance writer who for many years worked for the New York Times in their classical department. And he's always a delight to have on the show. Hello, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Dan. (laughs) Hello, everyone. You didn't say I'm a delight to have on the show. (laughs) Am I not delightful, folks? You're always delightful. (laughs) The next time that I moderate, I'll be sure to say that about you and not Alan. In fact, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Ken Michaels. You might know me for my syndicated Beatles radio show called Every Little Thing. Also, the co-host of another talk show, Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And for my own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which is loaded with lots of Beatles content and interviews and lots of Beatles topics. On the show, as I said before, we'll be talking about the brand new Mind Games box set with a very special guest that we'll have on. But as usual, what we bring to you in all of our shows is the latest in Beatles news. First of all, of course, as I just said, the Mind Games box set coming out on July the 12th and uh, a lot of treats on that box set that we'll talk about. Well, a lot of the uh, tracks, the individual tracks and all the different features we'll be talking about here on this show. There was a trailer online for Midas Man. This is the brand new movie that tells the story of Beatles manager Brian Epstein I have different reports as to when it will be released. IMDb says it will be coming out in theaters on August the 29th. You can check out the trailer online. Wasn't too thrilled with the very beginning of it because it's got the character of Brian uh, coming into a room, saying hello to the other Beatles, introducing himself as Brian Epstein. And I've always been told it's Brian Epstein. Actually... You, you guys can talk about this with me or correct me if I'm wrong, because I could swear Mark Lewis and talked about this in a Beatles show podcast. But really, the family name was Epstein, but Brian preferred to be called Epstein. And if you go back to the 60s, when he hosted a, a feature on Hullabaloo, he had his own little feature where he introduced a musical act. He said, hello, I'm Brian Epstein. So I've always pronounced it as Epstein. But people through the years have gotten it mixed up. But would you guys know? Well, I know at one point he was Brian. Uh, I'm not Brian. Um, no, I would. I think that we had uh, Vivek uh, uh, Tuari on. Yeah. Um, now I'm afraid I mispronounced his name. Tuari. And uh, we we talked about that, I think, in the interview that we did with him last year about that really, I think he said either one, it was all right. That they were both used. I tend to. I think. I think I've heard Epstein more often than than not. Yet my tendency is to say Epstein. Hmm. So well, when we get it right, 
we'll pass it along to you folks watching. Okay. Um, Yoko Ono was honored this past weekend in Peterborough, New Hampshire, being given the prestigious Edward McDowell Medal. She's only the second artist to be given this, and it was presented to Yoko's longtime manager, David Newgarden. Author and visual artist Neil Painter, chair of the McDowell Board, said in a statement, there has never been anyone like her. There has never been work like hers. Over some seven decades, she has rewarded eyes, provoked thought, inspired feminists, and defended migrants through works of a wide-ranging imagination. Uh, Madeline Baccaro, who is the author of the book on Yoko, um, in her mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono, she told me that this was actually streamed live. Didn't get a chance to see it. As far as I know, Sean was not there for this or any other notables like Elliot Mintz, for example. Engineer and producer Ken Scott, who engineered Beatles recordings and is also known for working with artists like David Bowie, Procol Harum, the Jeff Beck, <clears throat> the Jeff Beck Group, Supertramp, some of the Beatles solo works and others, has weighed in in Headline Magazine on what he thinks of the Beatles recording of Now and Then. When he was asked what he thought of that song by the magazine, he dodged the question by saying, so you want to talk about David Bowie, do you? And then he said, that's what I think about it. It's more to do with the fact that I know that George Harrison was not particularly fond of finishing it off back in the day. Scott was referring to when the Beatles worked on the song in 1995, and Paul McCartney said George called it effing rubbish. Paul told Q Magazine, George didn't like it, and the Beatles being a democracy, we didn't do it. Now, Olivia Harrison has said that it wasn't that George didn't like the song, but he didn't like the technical quality of John's demo. But as for the release of Now and Then, Scott says, to me, it's kind of milking a dead cow. It's putting something together to sell more records, that kind of thing. It's that if there are differences between the mono and stereo, we may be able to sell twice as many records. If we put out a new single that we put together, it doesn't matter if it's not quite as good as our old stuff, but it will boost the interest again. So maybe we'll sell more records. And the quote, Scott may uh, have an aversion to the recent releases of the Beatles, but he remains positive about his time working with the band. The very popular movie first released by George Harrison's handmade films, Time Bandits, is now premiering as a TV series. It will be shown on Apple TV. It actually premiered this past Wednesday on July the 24th. Among the actors listed for the series is Lisa Kudrow. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for this information. Uh, the six tracks from the backyard tapes from Paul McCartney that he released as an online exclusive vinyl version of one hand clapping through his website is now available for streaming on both spotify and apple and the video of paul performing his song blackpool is now available to watch on youtube conan o'brien's video show conan o'brien needs a friend just had james corden on as a guest and he tells the experience of doing his carpool karaoke karaoke sketch with paul mccartney and going to his home at forthland road um, music and celebrity journalist Chris Hutchins has passed away. He is known for having brokered the only meeting between Elvis Presley and the Beatles, and he even co-wrote a book on that called Elvis Meets the Beatles. After starting his career as a reporter for the Mid-Devon Times and later for NME in 1961, he later left that magazine to be a roadie for Little Richard when he played at the Star Club in Hamburg, where he shared a bill with the Beatles. Now, the Beatles used to give him a nickname. He called them, they called him Crispy. Yes. He says, Chris says, we hung out together in Little Richard's dressing room, washing amphetamines down with strong beer and catching steaks paid for out of his fat salary. When Chris rejoined NME at the end of the year, he was assigned to travel with the Beatles on their tours, and he was given a column with the tagline, living with the Beatles, and then he joined them for their tours uh, of the U.S. in 1964 and 65. He went on to form his own PR agency where he handled clients like Tom Jones, Engelbert Humperdinck, and Gilbert O'Sullivan. Chris Hutchins was 83. 
Some uh, very upsetting news concerning the founder, keyboardist, and primary songwriter for the Zombies, Rod Argent. Shortly after celebrating his 79th birthday and 52nd wedding anniversary to his wife, Kathy, he suffered a stroke. He has made the difficult decision to retire from touring. The Zombies had planned to do a final tour of the U.S., but that now cannot happen. Rod says he will continue to write music and record with the Zombies. He just can no longer go out live anymore. The Zombies were not only part of the British invasion, but Rod himself was a member of Ringo's All-Star Band in 2006, where he played his classic songs, She's Not There, Time of the Season, and also Hold Your Head Up. Let's all wish Rod well in his mm. recovery from the stroke. Um, Darren, I know that you just was at a special documentary yeah. in New York City about the zombies. Yes. Was there any talk about Rod with this? Uh, no, I, I talked about it. I was hosting, um, it was a screening, and what, uh, what I'm not, I, I still couldn't figure out, still don't know. Uh, I saw that the film actually started to appear last year, late last year. But yet, I don't know if there's been a formal um, launch of the movie. Uh, it's called uh, Hung Up on a Dream, okay. The Zombies. And um, it was a screening in Pleasantville, New York, at the Jacob Burns Film Center. <clears throat> and this was about a week in, about a week ago, maybe a little more than a week ago, and I hosted that. And um, I basically, it was, a, it was a week after he had had to stroke and... And uh, in my introduction, I mentioned to the uh, to the audience that, you know, the timing of this screening is kind of bittersweet with uh, the news that Rod Argent uh, just suffered a stroke. The impression I got from what I've read is that, um, of course, through PT and rehabilitation, he's very well, you know, continue to make music. It's being on the road that... Um, that wasn't going to happen. And he was going to, they were going to announce that the upcoming tour would be the final overseas tour the zombies were going to do anyway. <clears throat> so, um, and the, the, the documentary was really nice, straightforward history of the band as told by the members, uh, the surviving, I think it's four members of the uh, classic lineup. And, uh, I, is it Paul Atkinson, I believe, who passed? I yes. hope I have members. That he is his daughter represented him in the interview segments. Um, it's a good film, does a good job telling their story when you can and see that it's available. Uh, definitely don't miss it. Um, Hung Up on a Dream, a zombies documentary. Yeah, in fact, you and I, Darren, were talking about possibly interviewing Rod and Colin Blunstone. Last year, yeah. Yeah. And it just didn't come together for this show, but now I kind of feel, oh, gee, I could have maybe pushed harder to get him on. and But um, speedy recovery, if you know, if that's, you know, to Rod Argent. Yeah, I had the privilege of interviewing Rod and Colin way back when there was that tribute concert in New York City uh for mike smith of the dave clark five and uh this was at bb kings in new york and many of the performers who were going to be uh performing there i got to interview and uh really nice those two in the film they both come off like they're incredibly gracious mm. men especially colin bloomstone um you'll enjoy the movie i'll you know, I don't know what the plan is. I don't know where it's, you know, sometimes with these music documentaries, I find it frustrating because, you know, these films have been made uh, and they're out there somewhere. I'm still trying to figure out where the Blood, Sweat and Tears documentary went that came out a little over a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, so keep, just keep an eye out for the zombies documentary. It's. Yeah, and we'll let you know about that if we hear about it. Tremendous group, and uh, yeah. many times in concert, they're a real treat. Rod Argent is a wizard on the keyboards, and Colin yeah. Stone still sings like an angel. He's supposed to be touring on his own now. 
Now, um, actress Shelley Duvall passed away on July the 11th, and she does have a few Beatle connections. She actually dated Ringo Starr in the late 70s. And apparently at a time when Ringo was dating Nancy Andrews, there were moments when they were separated and Ringo dated someone else. Mm -hmm. So that's when this occurred. And since we happen to have just mentioned Time Bandits being made into a TV series, Shelley appeared in the in the film from 1981, which was produced by George Harrison's Handmade Films. Not only that, in 1992, Shelley had an animated series called Shelley Duval's Bedtime Stories, and Ringo was the narrator. How do you like that? Yeah. So that was pretty close in time to Shining Time Station as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and Shelley shared a birthday with Ringo. She was also born on July the 7th. Okay. Big loss there. A lot of people loved her work. Shelley Duvall. A new John Lennon exhibit of his artwork called Give Peace a Chance, the Art of John Lennon Exhibition, will open in Houston in their off-the-wall gallery. This is a newly curated exhibit in a limited engagement from August 20th to September the 7th. Admission is complimentary and open to the general public. All the artwork is on exhibition and available for purchase. These graphic works celebrate human love and communication, two themes at the heart of John Lennon's contributions to the art of the 20th century. Culture Magazine has a new issue out with John Lennon on the front cover titled John Lennon's Lost Years. It includes contributions from Sean, John's friends, and they say the photographer who, who captured his New York exile. I guess that's Bob Gruen. Um, we have an official release date for Elliot Mintz's new book, We All Shine On, John, Yoko, and Me. That's coming out October the 22nd. Uh, this year's Venice Film Festival will be featuring two new documentaries for Beatle fans, Kevin McDonald and Sam Rice Edwards' documentary, One to One, John and Yoko, focuses on the intense and public relationship between the two artists. This comes from Mercury Studios, and it's built around 16 millimeter footage from the only full concert that John ever gave after leaving the Beatles. There's another documentary called, this has the best title of them all, Things We Said Today. <laughs> it's from Romania's Andrei a-N-D-R-E-I, Andre. Wait a minute. That's our name. We we, we had it first. Yeah. Sorry. You got to get a little of this, I think. For them. <laughs> Actually, we should be paying the Beatles for these. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Oh, never mind. Yeah. So uh, Things We Said Today is a look at the band's famous and first North American tour, a film they say that was supposed to be ready 10 years ago. Recently, the company Culture Factory USA released Ringo's 80s album, Stop and Smell the Roses, and Old Wave on colored vinyl. Now, they'll be putting them out as picture discs on vinyl. Release date for those is November 15th, thanks to one of our listeners, Harry Benson. Not the Harry Benson, by the way. Um, we're going to close with a couple of things here to remind you of. Uh, Paul's photo exhibit, Eyes of the Storm, is still running at the Brooklyn Museum uh, through August the 18th. It's also being on display right now through September 24th in Japan at Tokyo City View. What do you know? Darren was also at the Brooklyn Museum as well. Yeah. yeah all over the place. WFUV did a did a uh, an evening, kind of a private tour for some of our... Um, uh, supporters uh it was you know benefit for wfuv and it was a well it was a private tour um an after hours type thing uh i would love to get back there to be able to, to look at everything on my own sometimes those tours can be a little difficult to, if you want to stop and look at a certain photograph or two you have to keep with the group and you've got the tour tour guide but it is a must see if you're in the new york city area and if you're not, it's still a must-see uh, at the Brooklyn Museum, like Ken said, until August 18th. Okay. Do you appreciate the photos more when you're really up close to them? or? Yeah. Yeah. And, and 
Yeah, and and when you can actually, if you see something that you want to read, you know, like the um, the card, the information, you want to spend a little time. time. So I'm hoping to get back there uh, in the next three weeks. But um, uh, you do appreciate it. Yeah, and and, and uh, he's actually a remarkable, remarkably good photographer, and um, there's some very interesting shots chronicling that very brief period of time uh you know when you look at these guys who were kids essentially and how their lives had been turned upside down and they're having the time of their life yeah little did they know what madness was ahead of them very lucky thing that paul just found those photos too yeah i love that that was part when the i i mentioned that to the tour guide i said can you wonder just he takes these pictures and they just they're in a drawer somewhere in one of the 25 storage units that are scattered around the globe. It's very good. If go Brooklyn Museum, go check it out if you haven't already. All right. We're going to close with news about two new books coming out. Uh, one from bestselling author and music journalist Patrick Humphreys called With the Beatles from the Town Where They Were Born to Now and Then as well as telling the story from the birth of Ringo Starr in 1940 to the group's breakup in 1970, With the Beatles also tells the story of how the Beatles' brand continues to live on long after their demise. With unique access to archives, interviews, and all media, Patrick Humphreys traces the Beatles' progress in cyberspace, on film, and in print. The author reveals how the group dominates auction house sales, including an interview with Hillary Kay from the BBC's Antiques Roadshow on the group's enduring appeal. The long battle with Steve Jobs' Apple is chronicled, and how the Beatles' own Apple company meticulously guards their legacy with box sets, re-releases, and documentaries. This is due out in August from Great Northern Books. And finally, another worthwhile book coming out is called Macca in the Long Noughties. Paul McCartney tracks life and tours 1998 to 2009 it comes from author ian derbyshire who also happens to be a fan of our show hey yes between that and the documentary things we said today we got it made here we wrote to us he wrote to us that it is being published in a variety of formats ebooks on kdp apple kobo etc and paperback on Amazon and various retail and online outlets. Uh, the book covers Paul's musical output, tours, and life in the period from the death of Linda to the end of the 2000s and his developing relationship with Nancy Cheval. This is an interesting period in Paul's life and career with significant ups and downs in Paul's personal life, a return to touring with a new younger band, the writing and release of two of his strongest late period albums, Chaos and Creation in the Backyard and Memory Almost Full, experimental electronic albums, Rushes, Twin Freaks, and Electric Arguments, plus classical works and collaborations. And that book comes out August the 20th. And don't forget the Fest for Beatle fans is taking place very soon at the Reed and C. O'Hare in Chicago. The dates for that, August 9th to the 11th. That's it. And and they've announced the 2025 dates for New York, New Jersey. Okay. And which did I don't know if you knew that, Ken. Yes, I did. Uh, oh, okay. It's the last weekend in March. Yes. Uh I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's the last weekend in March, 2025. Back and we'll be back at Jersey City. Okay. And that's it. That's mm -hmm. all the news I have for you this time. And like we promised, we have a special guest to welcome here to the show. He's been a guest on here before and on lots of Beatles podcasts, including my other one, Talk More Talk, to talk about the same topic he's going to talk about now. As you know, the biggest news item of the last few weeks was the release of the Mind Games box set. And Chip Mattinger is here. He is the co-author with Mark Easter of The Best solo Beatles reference book we've had to date eight arms to hold you takes you all the way up through the year 2000 all the solo Beatle releases there he is also the co-author 
with Scott Raley, with uh, the book Strange Days Indeed, which is part of a series called Leninology, and there'll be a new a new edition coming out soon. And uh, welcome, Chip, to the show. Hi, Ken, Alan, Darren. Great to be back. Great to have you. It's uh, I mean, it's an exciting time. Ever since this came out, uh, this is now ten, two weeks ago today. We're doing this on the twenty sixth. I've been just really devouring <laughs> these CDs and uh, loving every minute of it. We're going to be talking in detail about them. Um, but before we do that, I thought I'd ask Chip a few questions about mind games, just in general, what your impressions are of the album itself and how you feel it ranks among the albums in John's, well, unfortunately short catalog. Um, in regards to where it stands, that's a tough call because, you know, they all have their, their high points and they've all got their weaknesses, some just more than others. So, you know, if, if we figure that they're just the seven core albums, you know, maybe around number three, number four. Okay. You know. It's also and difficult it's to, to rank a John Lennon album the same way that you would a John Yoko album. I'm sorry? It's also difficult to rank a John Lennon album as you would a John and Yoko album where they're sharing the songs. Certainly, and and the, or sharing the production. There are just so many variables. that it, It's difficult. So that's why it's nice to get the, these comps where it details the full album and you can just take them in a chunk if you like and and, and immerse yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, are you a, a fan of remixed albums? Yes, I am just because in, when they use it for good, when the producers use it for good rather than evil, it's, it's you know, the results can be amazing just by it just because of the technology that exists now. Uh -huh. I'm a huge fan of the Atmos uh, format, and I hope it doesn't go the way of 5.1. I, you know, I hope it sticks around, but it, it's a it's a tough setup to, to prepare. Is a lot of equipment. And... Yeah. Um, is there any part of you that has to, um, you know, grapple with, with the fact that there's always the original mix that was there when the artist was alive. And that was the artist's vision of the album at that time. And in the case of John, obviously we, we know that Sean and Yoko are acting in John's best interest, but he's not here. And you don't know exactly how he would feel about what's being done, whether it's the 2002 remix or the brand new one that Sean's been working on, the one that just came out. How do you feel about that? Because there'll always be a part of me that feels whether you're talking about uh, you know, solo Beatles or Beatles, there's nothing like the original when all four were alive. <laughs> when right. Came out and, you know, when John was alive. And this was the first time, aside from, you know, Plastic on Old Band, which I know Phil Spector was involved with, but not heavily involved with when you think about the production of it, but a full production by John Lennon since Phil Spector was also somewhat involved with sometime in New York City and, of course, Imagine. Um, so John was more involved with the production on Mind Games. So the way he released it was the way that he heard it, the way he wanted it out then. Well, as you said, that uh, that mix is always going to be there. There are always going to be a copy of the Mind Games album out there. And that original release is going to remain consistent. Whereas these remixes, you might, you know, for example, in 2002, they used an alternate bass line on Meat City. And, you know, that's kind of one of the cool things about the uh, the remixes and the reissues is that, you know, there might be a little something different about it to make it special or, or, or more interesting. But in regards to overriding the originals, I think as, as long as it's still there, you know, there's, there's not a lot of harm in reproducing the albums you know with a new mix or in a, in a deluxe package mm. I add something um you know we had the remix in what did you say it was 2002 uh, of, yeah. of mind games um and then mm -hmm. there was the signature box which right. just remastered the originals and i think that probably 
is the best we're going to get of, you know, and, and, and unless technology improves further on in the future, that's the best we've got right now for what the original album was like, because the original LP pressings, uh, um, and I don't know if it's just me, I think other people feel this too, really was kind of muddy, you know, and I don't know that that's the mind games we want to live with. I think it, at right. least we need would need a, a high quality remaster of the original mix. And I think we have that on the signature box. So, you know, those things like, like Chip said, are so long as they're always out there for reference, you know, you, you know, which one is which and, and if they're labeled properly. Um, yeah. Once I mentioned something like this in an interview with, with Paul and he's, he said, yeah, but you know, you say labeled properly, but you know, a DJ playing it on the radio isn't necessarily going to go into whether it's an outtake or the finished version or, you know, which version they're playing. And some kid will hear it who's never heard it before and might hear the wrong one. And OK, fine. But you know what? And, and on the physical versions of it, they're labeled. And so we know which is which. And we can't even count on streaming <laughs> to provide us a consistent copy of an album mm -hmm. you know for example when when an album gets remixed in, in apple spatial audio which is their term for atmos you know that will replace the stereo version if, if you've got that toggle deal you, you won't have access to that stereo version anymore unless you go back in your settings and you turn off the atmos mm. so you know it, it's not it's like ellen said with labeling it, it's you know it might be correct but if you don't have that visual cue to how something, you know, what this actually is, it's going to be lost. Darren wanted to say something. Yeah, I have two part question. The first part for Alan, what is your opinion then? And I agree with you about the original LPs being a bit muddy and whatnot. Um, when they were transferred to CD the first time, the first CD issues, uh, did you were you happy with the way those sounded? Those are muddy as well. And I always kind of thought that was rock and roll and that was mind games. Those two, especially, they they seem to have like um they seem to have a pillow on top of them, both of those albums. And yeah. I always took that to be the way John wanted it as part of burying, hmm. especially his voice in echo reverb, and that tends to create this um you know, this muddiness that was taken away on remixes. And I'm not sure. I mean, it sounded great, but I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do. Hmm. Uh, and then I think we had that. I remember having this conversation here when the White Album box set came out. And that was uh, that was almost like a revelation to me because um, you got the stereo mix that we've known for decades. And some people know the mono mix as well. Um, I wasn't that familiar with the mono mix, but I knew there was a different mix that was created. Now, all of a sudden, the box set came out, which was remixed, and it was like almost this is now a third variation. I'm listening to the White Album on the, out of this box set, and I'm picking up on all these things, and I think they all sound cool. But does the general consumer understand this? They say label you talking about labeling i don't think these reissues are always very clearly labeled um you know i could go in a record store if i could find one uh that stocks beatles lps and having the mono lp separate from the stereo lp and then here's the u.s version of that lp the consumer is not the general fan is not getting it understanding it i mean um so I even said, you know, the White Album box set, should it have the original mix in here as well? And then here's an alternate new mix for 920, whatever year it was. But then they should um, also include the 2002 Yoko mix. Of the what? No, well, you're talking mind games. Yes. That's another example of that. That was, if my if I meant my memory, which isn't very good, it, it remembers properly when Yoko was putting those albums out around the turn of the century. Each one 
seem to um, there seemed to be more liberties taken with each one as they came out. The first ones, I think, were like Imagine might have been the first album they got reissued. Mm -hmm. And that I always thought was fairly faithful to the original mix. And then on Plastic Ono Band, there was some subtleties. And by the time they got to sometime in New York City in the last batch, it was almost like a completely different li listening experience. And I wasn't sure I liked that. That was not advertised that you were getting a new technically version of this. I like them. Does the does the general consumer get it? Probably not. Well, is this for Alan or for me? It could be for any, <laughs> anyone, really, I guess. Defer to you, Chip. Oh, well, I was just saying Mind Games is, is a – on CD is really quite the mess, as you were talking about the originals that, yeah. you know, crept out um, in the late 80s. Uh, the original – I believe those tapes were all taken off of LP master tapes, you know, that it had been mastered for cutting – and so that's one reason a lot of these reissues offer us a, hot, a greater frequency range. You know, we're, we're going to be able to capture a lot more bass or we're going to be able to capture a lot more treble because the CD can handle it. But the original Mind Game CD uh, came out without the Newtopian International Anthem indexed as a different track. Mm. So once they burned through those, they added it is its own index track. So here we are with two versions of the original Mind Games. And then they realized, oh, Mind Games, the song kind of sounds lousy on here. And they went in and put a no-noise version of Mind Games on it, but didn't touch any of the other tracks. So now we're up to three versions of Mind Games. Um, so it, it, it's reassuring or comforting to know that the original album is always going to be out there as a reference of the artist's vision. I think I missed yeah. the fact that it was missing the Newtopian National Anthem on first press. That's the one I have. <laughs> I have the first one. But yeah, the very first one, I think, comes up with 11 tracks if you put it in. Uh huh. Okay. Well, maybe they just. So put... all the indexing for everything on site two is wrong. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Hmm. I never knew, I never knew that because I think my, my original CD is not the original. It's the second because there is the. Uh, there is uh, the three seconds silent uh, in the index. Okay. I happen to like the original mix. I never found it muddy. You know, maybe I'm just so used to it. I never complained about it. So um... to me, that was a quality of Lennon's records, actually. Even sometimes, maybe even start, I, even going back to Imagine. Imagine seemed to have some sort of, I don't know how to describe it, but, you know, something kind of, burying it a little bit and it seemed to get increase uh as maybe lennon was producing them by himself uh by by mind games and stuff rock and roll was another one as i mentioned earlier is just plastered with so much echo and reverb on it um but i came to maybe like you saying ken that's how they to me they were supposed to sound that way i think and mm. that was part of the charm of these rough sounding records that john was more concerned with getting the energy and getting the uh getting the uh capturing the essence of the session than making it sound like second coming of abbey road a perfect uh you know slick slickly produced uh album and it's i an never felt philosophical that the question it's an interesting philosophical question that you run into when you when you talk about this kind of stuff especially john's overuse of reverb, which I always thought sounded cool. Um, but we know from reading interviews with him that he overused the reverb because he hated his voice. So so what do you do? Do you do you say, okay, um, sorry, John, you know, you're crazy. Your voice is great and we want to hear it directly. Or do you defer to John <laughs> as the artist saying, mm. Yes, but I like my voice buried in reverb because I don't like it or whatever reason. I like it buried in reverb and so there it is. It's kind of a it's kind of a weird conundrum, you know, because his voice was great. I think we can all agree his voice was great. And I think most other people would agree with that too except for John. 
but like we all hate our voices. It's it's you know it, it just seems to be a, a part of the human condition. So what do you do? But you know, um, even when he added reverb to his voice, I never felt like his vocals were buried. I always heard his voice loud and clear. Yeah. You know? But I think part of the magic of some of the recordings, even though I always feel the song is more important than the production, is what was done with John's vocals. I mean, think of the eerie quality of John's voice on a day in the life. Yeah. Do you want it to sound raw? Would you rather it be that way? So, yeah, uh, it's um, it's a difficult call here because this is the way John felt at that time. Maybe if he was alive today he might be a little bit easier on his voice and he he might think oh i didn't sound that bad at all but it seems to me like in the lennon camp there's this um they're trying to uh prove to the world by presenting john's voice raw that he had one of the greatest voices ever and i don't think you need to <laughs> convince john's fans or beatle fans of that we all know that but um, certainly on the other discs here on the set, you've got John's voice in the clear. Mm -hmm. The one disc where they don't have John's vocals, the Elements disc. But um, I just wanted to ask one more thing before we talk about the box set. But um, how many interviews did John give at the time for Mind Games? Because when you look at the book that came with the box set, there are times when there's very little said about the individual songs. So, and I love the book. There's a lot of quotes in there from John and from Yoko and from the musicians from the sessions, but he didn't really do that much promotion for Mind Games. Pulling up the list here. Hmm. Uh, there, there was a considerable amount of press um, and there was some UK radio. He did a, a, a story of pop interview, a, a rock speak interview. Um, he did an RIAS interview, which was uh, uh, for English speaking folks in Germany. Um, he did, uh, and he did an interview with Tony Price on Radio Luxembourg. And that's probably the one that is most complete when he goes through and talks about the various songs but the quality of it is is abysmal it's it's really difficult to pull out what he says yeah okay um and there's the one with um elliot mintz when they're on the beach right together. right um but not too much do we know about the individual songs i mean you could listen to the evolutionary disc here and know how it developed but what john had to say about writing each one he also touched on them all in the, the, the Playboy interview. And in some cases, they were just, you know, very, very terse answers. Right. You know, but, uh, you know, eventually, I think, well, and that's one of the goals with the future books, is to basically tie together John's comments on the songs to summarize what his feelings were about them. Hmm. Okay. Well, I can ask Chip a whole bunch of questions not related to the box set, but why don't we get into the box set? <laughs> Let's start with the remix disc and find out what you guys thought about it. And why don't we start with Chip? Um, with the ultimate mixes, is is they're calling you know this has become a template for for Lennon reissues now, you know, and the goal I believe of the ultimate mixes, if I interpret Sean's. Uh, interviews properly is that he wants to bring John's voice to the fore and to back off the supporting instruments. Hmm. So, you know, this is the, this is what the fourth in the set third and if you fourth, if you count the, uh, the give me some truth anthology. Okay. So, so it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to hear that criteria on the mind games album. But it's not going to be the one that I go to first if I want to hear the record. Which one would that be? Um, that, it, as of right now, would be the Atmos mix. Just because, just because it's 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 really something to to hear. Okay. Hmm. Want to talk about that now, um, at, Alan? You've heard the Atmos mix, right? Yeah. Okay. And Darren, you haven't yet. 
Right. Uh, well, I heard Ken, it at the at the you Ken, you and I heard it at the uh, the uh, listening uh, session right. that Universal held, and that was in the uh, Dolby Studios. And I'm probably not, uh, you know, the one really to ask about this because, I mean, we've been we've had sessions in that location before, and we have questioned the, the quality of the sound. Uh, the now and then one uh, comes to mind, but um, uh, so let let Alan and and Chip talk about Atmos because they can they can listen to a, their own system at home, right. and uh, they I think that's really how it, it should be experienced in the comfort of your own home with your own setup. Okay, um, uh, now, I should, Alan, why don't we start with you? I, I should say that um, you know if you heard it in the Dolby place, you, you heard probably an actual Atmos <laughs> experience. What I have is fundamentally still a 5.1 experience. You know, I haven't put like 70 other speakers around my, my room. It's, it's just mm. a 5.1 setup. So I think, you know, obviously what I'm hearing is a little bit more limited than what you heard. Um, but still, I mean, and, and that's, from my point of view, that's as far as I need, really. Five, you know, two speakers in the rear, three in the front. Um, I don't, yeah, well, I have a subwoofer too. Um, to me, you know, it sounded, and, and this is the, the same with the stereo remix. Um, while they're bringing his voice out more, which I think may be a bit less in the surround um i don't feel that the instruments are pushed too far in the background because what i hear in basically all of these tracks is like a greater profile for each instrument and especially the drums and bass i mean those yeah. the, the drums when when he hits a snare you hear it as a snare hit, unlike, you know, on the original LP, it was like a lot of original LPs. You, you, it's sort of like you're used to that sound as a drum, but mm -hmm. that's not like being in a room with a drum. This is a bit more like being in a room with a drum. Mm -hmm. um, also things like uh, Sneaky Pete's uh, slide, no, my pedal steel. Um, I barely even noticed that in the original mixes. I mean, in, in listening to this set, you know, not just the remix, but the elements mix and all that stuff. I'm I'm thinking, wow, you know, he's playing some really interesting parts that I never even noticed. And, you know, I'm sure they're in there. I bet if I go back to the original mix, which I didn't, uh, I'd, I might hear them now that I know they're there. But on this, everything is like present. And um, and now you would think, you know, for, with that as a description and my earlier complaint about it all sounding muddy, you would think that, well, if everything is all present, it's going to sound muddy, but it doesn't, you know. Um, and with the surround, you're getting a bit more space between the placements a lot. Of you got some place to put those guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, you put Sneaky Pete over here and Murata over here and. You know, See, that's what I really love about the surround mixes. You sit in the middle of the room and you feel like um, you just popped into the session and they gave you a chair in the middle of the studio and everyone's around you doing it. And that's like, it, that just feels really kind of cool. So See, I would love to experience that, Alan, but I think it would be unfair of me and probably Darren to describe our experience because from what I was told, because Darren and I sat together maybe five rows from the front. And I was told you really should be in the middle of the theater to get the full effect. So what I was hearing very much was John's vocals, very strong, very powerful, drums and bass, and everything else was pushed down. Hmm. I didn't really hear the backing vocals that much. Well, yeah, well, you know what? Uh, you mentioned the backing vocals. Uh, there were plenty of times those vocals weren't there. I, I swear they were not there. Mm. They seemed completely buried. And now if you're going to tell me I needed to sit three rows further back to hear the back and vocals, I'm like, wait a minute. Um, I also felt that uh, there were parts of uh, uh, David Spinoza's guitar playing that was crystal clear mm. that I was hearing 
uh, the complete lick that might have been partially buried in the original, you know, the original mix, which admittedly in my lifetime, I've probably listened to the original uh, CDs more than the vinyl. Um, so I'm not used to hearing like the complete guitar lick when everything is clear. But uh, I mean, those vocals, I think you and I actually made eye contact and it was the. Um, I think it was one day at a time, the first song where there's a prominent female vocal and it was not there. At least you heard it off. Off to the side and we both I you looked at me like you heard that and thought yeah. what they do was the was the was the female vocals. Right. Um, which is in this case, I guess it's that vocal group, something different. Yes. It, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who also was on Feeling the Space, a Yoko's album. But anyway, um, yeah, those vocals weren't there, right? <laughs> Tell Where me I need it. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it, but still, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's like at the Alan. Atmos mix. You, you put it on in your house, and if you have to go, you know, get something out of the kitchen in the refrigerator, it's going to sound like a different song when I get over to the other part of the house. Hmm. Uh, I Yeah, I, those those vocals were not there. Right. From our seats. <laughs> Another comment on the Atmos, and, and Al and I have touched on this briefly, is when a super deluxe package like this is produced, normally it's just the core album that is treated to the, the immersive mix. Usually, you know, I'm sure it's because of cost concerns. But what's been really cool about this box is that even the additional dicks have been mixed in surround. Uh, some of they all say Atmos, but some of them are just a a seven one and an Atmos wrapper. But there are there is discrete information on many of these discs, which is something they they haven't done before. Right. I mean, now we get surround for everything and and not just the main album. Mm -hmm. That's nice. A lot it's, of it's great are put in that way. So right. I think plus, you want to plus the about? fact that the Blu-rays have all the 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 Easter eggs, right? So it turns out that there are versions on the CDs too. Um, I think on the first first CD where there are the ninety tracks of Silence, you have to go yeah. all the way to the ninetieth one, and uh, oh no, that that's something else that turns up. That on that one, that turns up letters that you can put into the new Topian identity card. Yeah, there are so many. Talk about mind games. Yes. <laughs> this album is so full of mind games, this this release of it. Um but but yeah, I mean the 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 Blu-rays have the the bonus tracks and you gotta do things like go to the first track and then go backwards. On one of those. Yeah. And, and then it lists <laughs> it's uh yeah. I I don't know how people who um don't frequent, you know, all of these internet collectors groups figure out how to do some of this stuff because um, it's not obvious and it's not something that you would necessarily find by accident. Like who puts on the first track and goes, you know, backwards? No one does that. Everyone assumes the first track is the first track. So you wouldn't go reverse, but you have to do that to get to the bonus tracks. Very you weird. Wait till someone discovers that, and then the word spreads on the internet. And, and then the they... word spreads. Yeah, that's you need the internet for this release. <laughs> and for those fans of streaming and digital, you can't do that with streaming or digital. Don't think. I just wait till someone I know, a real friendly person, might just send me the files. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, is there anything else you want to add about the Dolby chip? I don't think so. It's just if you have the means or the opportunity to listen to any of these albums with the immersive mix, by all means, take it. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll talk about the remix itself of individual songs. Were there any that really stood out for you that you really enjoyed in particular? Um, not not on the, the initial disc. I mean, there were fascinating things on on both the elements and the elemental mixes and then of course the the uh, the history mixes uh what they call them again the evolution mixes right 
So with, without going through the whole box, but I, I tended to, to to gravitate more to those discs than opposed to to hearing just a, a variation on the Mind and Games album itself. Yeah, there is some weird oh. little things like like uh, you know, where's the saxophone solo at the end of one yeah. day at a time? You know, but it's mm-hmm. on the. Um, I think it's on the it's on the elemental mix or one it's on one of those mixes where you know you get to the end of the song and there it is, but it's mm-hmm. not in the remix of the old right. remix. Why? Uh, you know, there was. I, I'd love. Um, you know, I looked in the book for some sort of explanation. You know, and they never said. You know, why? And now there are versions floating around where people have taken the new mix. The and added that saxophone bit onto the end of it. So here we have another variation that's going to end up going down as, as a, a legitimate one when it, which really just a, a remixers, remixing groups, right? Take on the song, trying trying to restore it. It's kind of like yeah. um, with the new version of Let It Be. Um, some people right. put on the original ending you know, with the freeze of John and the get back uh, coda and also in between the uh, sections, Twickenham and uh, Apple and the rooftop, the sliding door thing that that, that was taken out in this version. So um, I, I know someone who did uh, uh, what he calls retro version <laughs> of, of Let It Be. So it has, it has <laughs> all that. And then after the original ending with the get back coda it then goes into oh darlin you know from the the new version interesting i wrote down in my notes the there's more sax playing towards the end that you didn't hear on the final mix in the raw studio mix of one day at a time see i'd like to know the reasoning behind these and all the different versions that came out I think the technology offers us the ability to maybe squeeze a little bit more out of what would have been a fade out as opposed mm-hmm. to the album where it gets lost in, in the noise floor of, of, of the medium. Um, so I, I believe it's the technology and obviously the source tape plays a huge role in how good some of these things are going to sound or, you know, how long the fade outs are and the, and the like. Mm. I mean, there's that, uh, I guess it's the fade out of uh, uh, Meat City at the end of the album where John is, why are they doing those strings? And it's not there on disc one, which is the one that I view. This is the, this is Mind Games. Well, now, no, it's a new mix of Mind Games getting back to what we started. But then elsewhere, um, I guess it's maybe in the documentary uh, uh mm-hmm. disc version there you hear john talking as the song was ending why are they doing these strange things so um oh. or whatever <laughs> that, whatever he says that little clip has that uh, john's interjection there has been trimmed off the majority of mind game cds that have been available to date and and everybody's you know kind of complained that you know why why did they cut that off? Well, now it seems with the new album that they've just brought it more to the fore. So you guys want to hear it? Here it is. Is it? It gets its own disc, right? <laughs> well, if you want to uh, hear if you want to hear that that uh, ad lib from John at full volume, <laughs> you have to go to the Evolutionary. Uh, oh, is that the one? But it's also on the raw studio mix, right? But it's probably not as loud. So why is there even a difference in the volume? I don't know. Different mixer. I was hoping that they would actually allow us to hear uh, the uh, manipulated voice from Meat City reversed, so we could hear what is actually being said. Now tell me it's in there, and I haven't found. Well, the, the voice itself has not been extracted and okay. given its own track or anything, but it's it's simple enough to to pull out and flip it. Yeah, no, I've done that. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I haven't. I haven't heard any any additional 
material from that session. Um, and I don't think we even know who said it. I don't, I don't think engineer. we know what engineer said it. Oh, yeah, it was an oh, engineer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but which one? Right. So I haven't seen that documented anywhere. Hmm. Are there any significant differences that you hear in, in uh, the remix other than John's vocals up and hearing the bass and drums? I think that what you were saying before, even about the Dolby mix, applies to Alan, um, the remix, because there is a clarity and a separation that you hear in the instrumentation that you didn't hear before. And that really benefits on the new remix. You can hear the different instruments, certain uh moments there uh john's harmony vocals you can hear the different vocal line <laughs> you know stuff like that that you didn't hear before that's what's so cool about the atmos is they can isolate those additional little harmonies and the like and put them in their own place in the mix right so if, if you want to if you want to isolate that channel then that's that's all you're going to get right yeah i wrote down a few notes on individual songs about what i heard if you just want to go through them really fast on the title track of mind games john's vocals are louder everything else is clearer and the piano parts what are i guess they're eighth notes or 16th notes you hear them more um tight as david spinoza's guitar is up and gordon edwards bass is up mm -hmm. um on I see Masen, all the instruments are clearer, but there's sound effects that they used on the original where it ends with wow, 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 mm -hmm. and they took that out, which is a shame because that you know that was a very cool effect the 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 tape loop at the end of the song right. from the from using tape echo as opposed to a digital echo in a in a in a workstation nowadays. You know, yeah. they just had a a separate machine that was rolling that they pan in and out and, and they just left that up at the faders up at the end of the song. Okay. I'd love to know the reasoning why, but why they couldn't include that. Uh, one day at a time, we talked about the saxophone and actually, if you listen to all the different versions of one day at a time, you'll hear John sing one day at a, at a time is all we do. And then he goes, be do, be do, be do, <laughs> which I never <laughs> heard before. Minor thing. But, you know, these are things that, that I pick up. Not only is there no sax at all at the very end, but there's sax playing before that that Michael Brecker played that you don't hear at all. Okay. Um, bring on the Lucy. It sounds like John still has reverb on his on his vocals in this mix. But um, it's clearer and more separated. Um, there's something really strange about the bass that I heard in the very beginning. It sounds a little wobbly. For some reason only on the remix if you listen to it maybe you might be able to explain why it feel it feels that way uh the drum fills are really uh pronounced you hear more of john singing the do it do it do it do it do it and answering to um free the people now um intuition the drums and bass are up you hear all the parts more the drums uh the drum fills are crisp the piano solos up a little the acoustic guitar on Out the Blue, the very beginning, is much clearer. John's voice is really powerful with a little reverb, it sounds like. The piano solo from Kenny Asher is hotter. Um, Only People has some differences. Um, the original mix had John more mixed with the backing vocals, and here he's pushed up and the backing vocals are still felt, but they're not as overpowering. Um, and there's a lot of ad-libbing on all the versions of Only People. Um sings keep on keeping on a lot um i know i know the guitars at the intro are more up front and you can hear john's harmony vocals like i just said you are here john's lead vocals more up front the backing vocals from something different were pushed down um meet city john's vocals still seem to have some reverb lead guitar is heard at the beginning of this of the song um more clear there's more clarity in all the instrumentation that's just what i picked up on the on the remix you were copying... Alan, you remember go ahead darren no i was just say ken you were copying my notes because you were sitting next <laughs> to me because we kind of made the same notations on on uh on the songs 
uh, things like only people to fade out to me was clearly it was longer, mm. uh, you know, and uh, that Meat City uh, had absolutely no echo at all on it. And it was heavier and funkier, but still played like a completely different mix. Uh, mm. And the missing saxophone that we've talked about, the missing backing vocals were the things that uh, and that ending to uh, I can never I don't know how to say S A Ace Mason. I I I still ain't my son. I th- yeah, excuse me. The blushing. How you no, produce kidding. it? Yes. Um, that at the ending there, that missing uh, uh, guitar part, that effect, uh, that was- all all my notes. But mm. Alan, we chip was gonna. I was gonna say the clarity of of the new mixes we we've all kind of noticed. And Alan, do you recall on the Lennon tapes when we'd first start getting those rough mixes of things from? The mind games album and it's like oh my gosh there's a there's a high end on these you yeah. can actually distinguish the instruments and the like yeah yeah i mean that was my feeling as well i mean this the same things i said about the surround mix uh and the and the instrumental profiles and clarity really apply to the to the main stereo remix as well um and and because of that, I began hearing just sort of aspects of the songs that I hadn't really focused on before. I mean, Tight Ass, for instance, which to me had always been just a throwaway track. You know, it's it's OK. Nice rocker. Next. Um, this time I really got pulled into it and heard, you know, a little more country influence than had been apparent to me before. Um, but also because the drums and bass and the guitars were so much clearer on it, it really just sort of just sort of captivated me in a way that that track never has before. Um, you know, it's to me, it was between two great songs, really, Mind Games and I Sumu Sen, and uh, it, it just got lost. But now it's, you know, it. I think... Uh, that's true of the other things on the album that I sort of had shrugged off in a way before. I mean, I always liked the album, but not absolutely every second of it. But this mix, to me, just was so uh, sort of really pulled you in, you know, just because everything is so clear and you're hearing so much more of what's going on. And then and consequently, so much more of what John and the players around him had in mind when they made it. Um, so to me, the the remix was a big improvement. I mean, but, you know, given those things that are missing that were also part of the original, uh, that's, you know, I, I would rather they have included all those elements so that it would just be a greatly improved mix rather than, a different mix. <laughs> I guess I think it's going to be a different these... mix no matter what, but because if it's a new mix, it's a new mix. I think one thing that these new mixes have revealed is that there are really two unsung heroes of the Mind Games album, and that's going to be Sneaky Pete and Gordon Edwards mm-hmm. and their contributions to this album. You know, when you hear them taken in an expanded context, uh, the playing is just miraculous. It's fantastic. Right. Yeah. Well, the other podcast show that I do, and I remember saying this on Talk More Talk, this box set is really like a love letter to all the musicians that were involved with it because through all these different mixes, you get to hear all the contributions mm-hmm. that maybe were hidden in the full mix from the original album. And, you know, David Spinoza's guitar work is outstanding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not Kenny Asher. I mean, one of the greatest moments on this album is the piano playing on Out the Blue. Mm-hmm. So that there's a few versions here where it's a longer version of Out the Blue with just another piano solo from Kenny Asher. And uh, and I love Jim Keltner's drumming. And Rick Murata is really only drumming with Jim on Meat City. Mm-hmm. He plays the bongos on uh, Bring On the Lucy, but it's mainly Jim Keltner who's drumming on on the album. But all of them are just wonderful. And uh, 
It's a strange thing because I've always loved Mind Games. I've said for a long time it's my favorite Lennon album. I never thought I could love the album more. But because you realize what every musician was contributing, and when you hear the songs in different ways, when you remove certain instrumentation and you focus on just a few of the instruments, then you realize all the work that was put into it. And you realize how great these songs really are. I mean, One Day at a Time is a song I always liked. Now I just absolutely love it because of all these different versions that are on here when it's stripped down to just a few instruments and that's it. But, well, the uh, other Beatles notwithstanding, uh, this is the first album where John has worked with a group of musicians that can, can play. I mean, these guys are the, the best musicians that John's worked with. Um, and, and they can translate his vision into, into, you know, their, their individual parts. And it's, it, it's, I think that might be one thing that contributes a, a lot to the different sound of the album. Hmm. I say That's a word about looking. this thing, the book, <laughs> um, in terms of what we were just talking about, I mean, each of the musicians has an awful lot to say in here. I mean, they've, they've lifted quotes from John from various interviews, but a lot of the other musicians are speaking really for this project. Um, and, you know, I'm sure they got some archival interviews from them too to draw on. But um, the, the other thing about it is uh, one thing that I found, okay, there's a million things about this book that I love. Um, and, you know, Chip knows the material, the, the raw material, a bit better than I do. So there may be problems with the book that I haven't seen that Chip can point out. But it lists every outtake and it describes what's on every outtake. Um, it shows all the tape boxes. It shows the tracking sheets, the um, the 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 typed lyrics or handwritten lyrics in some point. Uh, but the other thing is that the musicians were allowed to speak as musicians. I mean, there's one point where um, I think it's David Spinoza is talking about uh, something that, that Gordon is doing on bass. It's a, uh, he, he says a, a passing tone to the four chord. And a lot of editors would make you change that either just take it out or change it to something that people who haven't studied music theory would understand more easily. And I love the fact that they just left it that way. Um, it's an argument I have always had with editors going back to the times, you know, I mean, it's like you say something technical and it's as if like, well, only three people in the world understand technical and that's not true. Um, but so like that Wonder. in itself was a, really impressed me. And, uh, you know, I, I, there's a ton in this book and this is the small book, right? There's another right. coming out in the fall that goes into even greater detail. I can't wait to see that. Well, it's in the cube. The, the oh, right. Thames and Hudson book is in the cube. Hmm. I just got the cheap $165. <laughs> There was, um, oh, here it is. You made me think of something there, Alan. Um, Meet City, the evolutionary mix. Gordon, Gordon Edwards says, not everybody can make a fill, I swear. <laughs> so little things like that. I mean, maybe John wanted a lot of fills, whether it's by the bass or the drums or something. And there's a few quotes from Yoko here and there where she's making suggestions about making a song faster. You know, I, I find that really interesting. I wish there was even more of that. Well, one thing about the album that the new package has revealed is how active Yoko was during the production of the backing tracks. You can actually hear that she was there in the studio and on some of the boxes. I'm not sure if they're the boxes that are shown in the book. She's actually listed as a co-producer. Mm -hmm. There you go. So with the elemental mixes, which, as I said before, is without any drums on any of the tracks, are there any that really stood out for you that you feel really benefited this way? Yes. When on yeah, uh, um, on the on the yet we're talking elemental or yes, elemental. Okay. Um, 
you know, just some of the things that came out that you couldn't, you know, were just mixed out completely. You, you hear both pedal steel parts, one in one channel, one overdub in the other channel. And it, it's just, that was very exciting to hear. The bass line being isolated with the drums on Meat City was very cool to hear. And how they placed Keltner in one speaker and Marat in the other. Mm. So that you can d- actually distinguish what those guys are playing. Right. Um, those were probably two of the biggest out the blue. I, I found it real interesting that the opening guitar signature came from a Ken Asher fill later in the song. Right. Okay, they, so um and it, it's things like that, that that really just don't pop out until they're they're the spotlights placed on them. Yeah. There's certain things like um like you were just saying there, Chip. Out the blue actually starts with um every day, I think, the Lord and Lady part. So at some point during these sessions, John must have thought, let's have a an acoustic guitar intro at some point. There was a lot of editing on this album too. Hmm. You know, I think you can go back and for example, tight as might be composed to like six different edit pieces all in different, you know, that have been resequenced. I think out the blue uh, had that. I believe Meat City had that, but you know, there's enough here for anybody. One thing I noticed was that in all these versions of Meat City, the band just goes right into the song, and you don't hear John with the "well" at the very beginning. At some point, he had to think about that. He probably didn't know. Well, how do I start the song? You know, it had some hot beginnings, just yeah. starting cold like it did. Um, but yeah, that that introduction to that song is is just you know one of the highlights of the piece. Mm-hmm. What I like about one of the uh, mixes later on in the box uh, of Meat City is you really can appreciate how complicated the rhythm track was. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps that's why both drummers uh, are playing on it to give two different kind of feels and and i just got a kick out of lennon counting one two three four boom whatever he was doing with the uh the uh trying to count the putting that extra beat in there um one two three four boom and then having the speed of am i counting too fast and the discussion with the other musicians i think that comes out that's later on probably in the uh discovery uh, no the evolution disc which has to document little audio documentaries for each song yeah another thing about uh meat city is that there are plenty of times there where he's not singing the bin meat city part you just hear the guitars and the band right. play instrumental there so he hadn't come up with that yet right so it's also another part of the evolution of that song this interesting interesting stuff uh for me i love one day at a time on here you have John's double track vocals with uh, the backing vocals of something different and the the electric piano in there from uh, Ken Asher, but the backing vocals are brought up in the mix. And sometimes you just remove something like the drums and it has a whole different feel altogether with it. Which version are you talking about now? Which mix? One day at a time from the elemental mixes. Okay. But it's still got that falsetto vocal. And I like it. You know, that's another thing that Yoko played a part in because she she um, suggested to John to do it in falsetto. But, you know, even though John used falsetto vocals at times throughout his career, I don't think there's any other song where it's all falsetto. So, no, Not that I can think of. Here you go. You got several from Paul, but that's the only one from John. At least we've got a straight vocal that we can choose from. That's true. And we had that in the um, John Lennon anthology. Right. Right. All right. The elements mixes in some ways I found to be one of the most interesting for me personally. These are all mixes of the songs in the album without John's vocals at all. So you hear just instrumentation. And in some cases, it's only a few instruments. So... Any comments you want to make about that particular set? Um, Tight as the the elements mix of that 
has got to be my favorite track on the whole box. Hmm. Um, Sneaky Pete was an overdub. He uh, he wasn't a part of the tracking sessions, and it, it's 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 thrilling to hear you know his first pass or whatever pass it was at an overdub in the left channel, and the right and the other. So and he's also picking up on Spinoza's lead lines that that were on the basic track and is translating them into pedal steel. And it's it's just fascinating you know, as a guitarist to, to hear how all of these parts were woven together. Mm. Um, as for the elements, I, I think I'm saying the same thing as you guys are, that it was just exciting to hear these things isolated. Right. But you yeah, know, we talk a lot point. about the um, the 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 sort of regular listener. Uh, I can't remember what term Ken usually uses. Um, a, a lot of these regular <laughs> non-specialist listeners, uh, non-collector listeners, um, probably really wouldn't care much about this stuff or even know what to make of it. But for us. Um, it's just incredible to hear, you know, like, like Chip was saying, Sneaky Pete playing off David Spinoza, you know, you're hearing music making happening. You're hearing the album mm -hmm. coming together in a way that nobody knew when they walked into the studio that morning that it would, because it has to do with musicians playing and hearing each other and responding to each other. Um, and that's what these mixes the elements mixes and also in a way the evolution mixes kind of show us and they may not be sort of like okay easy listening for people who aren't you know totally devoted to this stuff but and I, I don't know what would happen, you know, for for one of those people if one of these things comes up on Spotify or something like that, what they make of it. <laughs> but for us, like the, I think this is, and I think would think for anyone listening to our podcast, like this is what makes these sets so incredible. You know, it's not just that we get a clean remix of the album and a surround mix of the album, but we're also getting to see how it happened, you know, in a way that we haven't been able to see before, you know, no matter how much we've been able to read about it, you know, you can get a bit from bootlegs, but this is even better than bootlegs in a way, because with bootlegs, it's not like you can sit at the desk and say, okay, let's just hear the pedal steel. Let's just hear the bass, you know, and, mm. and that's what this is offering. And it, I think it, it was brilliant of, of Sean, to do this if this was his idea, which I suspect it was. Um, and yeah, really glad, glad that they did it this way. Well, you know, actually, we're living at a time when, because we have the technology to do it, there's a lot of isolated stuff that you can find on the internet. Mm -hmm. And if you go to YouTube, uh, I mm -hmm. was listening over a month ago to Rubber Soul, and it was just the bass and drums. Right. And it's fascinating. So this stuff is coming out there. So maybe Sean is aware of that, and he knows yeah. the fans that want to hear this stuff. And so he's giving us the most that he can with yeah. what he's got. So, I mean, you can dissect the surround mixes and and, and get a lot of this stuff, you mm -hmm. know, if if you want it. Uh, so, so in a way, there they're giving us even more than it looks like they're giving us. <laughs> mm. Right. Okay. Darren, any thoughts about the elements mixes? Yeah. You know what? My, my opinion of the elements mixes uh, changed drastically. The first time I listened was the exact opposite of what you guys said. I found it to be, you know, you can say it. yeah, I, I, I'm trying to find the right way to put it. Not it was it was it didn't grab me, and then I realized, yeah, you know, and then I realized why, and it was probably because the first time I think I tried to dig through the box. This is not a box set meant for you to sit down. I'm going to spend the next three hours with this because by the end of the three hours, you you you. <laughs> You have to, this is a set that you have to, I think, decide one day. I'm going to sit down, I'm just going to listen to disc four. Or I'll listen to the original mix. I'll listen to, I'll pull out my old LP and then I'll play the elements mixes 
uh, and do a little comparison and then leave it there. Because when I went back to the elements mixes, um, uh, I got I got more out of it. listening to it, not in a big crash. You know, you're studying for a final and you're trying to go through the entire textbook, which I did almost all it. But anyway, that's another story in itself. Um, you have to spend time with with this set separately. Um, and uh, so that's why my initial opinion was, you know, this is kind of becoming overkill now. Wait a minute. Let me back off and come back to certain parts of this set. And that's how you have to listen to this. You'll appreciate it more. Um, so. Hmm. You should just take your time in digesting. Yeah. It. In yeah. In the and case of us, we have 10 days <laughs> to take yeah. it all in. You know, it's funny. That's one of the drawbacks of, like, say, doing a show like this. Yeah. Is that you do have to, and then it becomes a little bit of, a, can become a bit of a, a race against time. Mm. Uh, you you feel like, oh, we got to do, you know, people want to hear what we think about this. Okay. Uh, got to listen to this fast. And you can't, you shouldn't do that, especially not with this set. Maybe other boxes, you could do it. Um, and, uh, you know, and even working in radio. I found that my the way I listened to music changed through the years. When I was a kid, there was nothing like getting a new album, putting it on, sitting there, reading the lyrics, spending time with the notes, with the cover or the artwork, and then the next, maybe later that same day, listening to it again, to the point where you remember the words, you remember the ins and outs of it. Working in radio, it was like, here comes 10 new songs I got to listen to to see if other people will like. Okay, mm -hmm. one, two, Okay, that's it. Move on. Next stack. And, you know, that's not really the way to appreciate something. So you're getting the mind games box set and you haven't started listening. Take your time with it. Listen to it in pieces here and there. These are demanding, you know, of the listener. You, you've got to put your back into it you know, and, and you'll get, I think, a listening experience out of it that, that you wouldn't of if you were just trying to to crash through it and, and catch them all in one afternoon. But the interesting thing here is that with all the different parts that these musicians played, there are really interesting parts that they added to the songs. And whereas as much as I love the plastic on all band box set, it's as raw an album as you can get anyway. And how much more can you really strip sure. to the point where I get confused between one version and another version of the same song. But here, once you study it, you can figure out, oh, yeah, that's the elemental mix. I you know, have a I, yeah, I have a question of chips. Now, this is getting off the mind games topic for a moment, but maybe maybe there's a connection. Uh, what happened to the sometime in New York City set that we were supposed to get a year ago? I don't have a definite answer on that. I'm sure it was delayed or canceled because of the, the first track. Um, I've got a feeling that, you know, some of that stuff, I think, showed up in the mind game set. Some of the things they prepared for some time in New York City. I also have a feeling that there's going to be some sort of tie in to the Mike Douglas documentary and uh, to the one to one documentary. OK. I was just curious because mind games, as I've joked on the on the air at WFUV, it's the 50th anniversary celebration of an album that's 51 years old. Uh, but hey, who's yeah. counting, you know, and wondered if whatever happened behind the scenes with some time in New York City, if that somehow is tied into mind games coming out now. And, and I, I th think we're finding with this renaissance of all of these box sets across all of these different artists that even though they're planning for a 50th anniversary release, they just can't get the thing together in time and okay. to get a, to get a release date that they want for it um it was a, there was a back to the back to mind games the one thing that just popped into my head and i'm sorry i'm jumping around but sometimes if i don't say that <laughs> if i don't say something when i'm thinking of it there was a um a mix of, i think it's um it's tight as from the evolution documentary the documentary disc um uh i found it really interesting it was one of my favorite moments on the box set where you actually hear the beef jerky 
terrific right. beef jerky started in tight as and yes. you hear it as part of the song and it eventually got worked out as they were putting recording the song and then it came out as a separate instrumental on walls and bridges that we I go back to the underground stuff the the, the, the beef lurky yeah uh, beef lurky jerks um the beef jerky licks are apparent in the demo as well <laughs> It's just like um, that demo from Meat City. At the very end, you hear John sing the line that is in Stealing Glass. Right. Melody line. You know, you have to listen to the end of it. You don't oh. want to hear me sing. <laughs> but you never know. I mean, certain things eventually you'll hear later on in, in uh, a song a year or two later from John. You just never a know. Lot a lot of these mind game songs date back to 71 if not even earlier yeah like mind games mm -hmm. right you know yeah. it's just kind of yeah mind games coming from from the make love not war and the i promise yeah and even earlier from the and i believe it shows up on one of the blu-ray discs where john's working it out sitting on the bed at tittenhurst, tittenhurst park looking at the blueprints for the lake that they're putting in so mm. he's just sitting there strumming along while he's at least checking out these blueprints hmm. all right some things i just wanted to point out with the elements mixes again one day at a time is a real highlight it's just john on electric piano so there's no ken asher there whatever you hear on the piano is just john playing it and gordon edwards plays the bass nothing else and it's gorgeous just like it just like just as itself it stands by itself as a piece of work you know, it's easy to sing along with it, but I just think the beauty of those two instruments together, it's just wonderful. And one of the other things I love about the Elements mixes is Bring On the Lucy, because you really hear, not just in this version, but in other versions, the incredible bass playing of, of Gordon Edwards on that mm -hmm. song. It's just all over the place what he's playing. And you hear that and the backing vocals from something different. Rick Murata on the bongos. John plays the maracas and the tambourine. The bass line is just fantastic. And it has a whole different feel without hearing any of John's lead vocals. <laughs> you know, it's like a piece of work unto itself. Um, another thing I discovered with um, the Elements mixes, I Know I Know, um, had actually saxophones at the end of the song that mm -hmm. were not really used in the final mix. Yeah, yeah. You know? So Michael Brecker is work there. So there's a case of where John didn't use. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and uh, so I found that to be interesting. So. Um, and I like all the versions, even though I haven't said much about it on intuition. You know, some of it's very loose. It just sounds like um, John's having a lot of fun with that song. And I never understood why that that couldn't have been a, a second single from the album by the way there's something else i wanted to bring up chip and that is you always heard how john liked to work quickly and go more for the feel mm -hmm. again, if you take a look at the notes here for mind games there were some songs he worked on a lot <laughs> like yes. you here there's a lot of takes of you are here um I wrote it down let me find that sheet here so i can could that also be ken uh coming on, out of Sometime in New York City, John feeling that he needed maybe to put a little more effort into what he was putting out as a follow up because the reaction to sometime in New York City, you know, hurt him. And uh, maybe he felt it was a little bit on, at stake here with mind games. I never thought about it that way. It's possible. I know he was I, I he was he was. Very disappointed by the reaction sometime in New York City got. I um, have bootlegs of some of John's other stuff, and you can go back to the Plastic Ono Band, and he did a lot of takes of, uh, like, Love. There are certain songs, and you would think, oh, he probably did a, you know, a few takes, and it was done. But no, It's like How on the Imagine album. That was a tough one to capture just because of the dynamics yeah. and, the, and the timing on it. Right. Um, there were a lot of takes here of you of, of uh, 
out the blue, 38 takes about the blue. Okay. 26 takes about intuition, 15 takes initially of I know, I know. And what's interesting about this is on the the last day of the sessions, he basically retract uh, songs that, that he wasn't happy with the first time around. So we get a uh, a remake of Tide As, we get a, a remake of Lucy. Um, even the session before that, he remade Rock and Roll People because he wasn't happy with it. Hmm. So uh, I think some of it has to do with the difficulty of, of the piece that they're working on has a lot to do with the uh, number of takes and also that John might not know exactly what he wants until he hears it. Hmm. Okay. All right. It's just that, you know, after all that you've heard these years, you'd think that he wanted to just bang them out real quick, you know, right. The band captured the the spirit, the energy, and exactly what he heard in his head. Then it's done. Well, some of the takes were in the single digits mm -hmm. on a lot of the songs. I see the sen was three takes. Mm -hmm. Does it say how many takes the Newtopian International Anthem was? <laughs> no paperwork on that. There's <laughs> <laughs> something uh, we haven't mentioned. Uh, another uh, thing that I enjoyed was using the uh audio of the press conference mm -hmm. for for uh the Revolution. launch of uh the announcement of the formation of utopia not the launch that's in the uh, outtakes disc I'm which is at the end not on the blu-ray somewhere that the, the actual visuals from the press oh, conference yeah. aren't out there because they do exist right that was one short press conference that yeah. was the whole thing no, no, it's considerably longer, but it's back and forth with the with the crowd and 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 uh, Leon Wilds gets in there and does a spiel as well that wasn't included on on the mind games box. Okay. Let's see all together. Let's see, that was what April of April. It was April second. April 2nd of 73. I don't know if I timed all that stuff out or not. Hmm. Now, I, I didn't, I haven't timed those yet, but yeah, there are, there are a lot of trims out there from the press conference that are available. Okay. So we also have the evolution documentary. We talked a bit about it. Any, any other songs that really stand out for you guys? uh chip tight as was cool just because you heard the development of uh spinoza's guitar parts and how they kind of changed from a a chet atkin style uh into more of the the melodic pieces that ended up on the album hmm. um trying to think for the other evolutions um they're all starting to get mixed up right now <laughs> another thing that happens when you listen to a lot of these discs all at once it's right. not just me yeah but, but no those are fascinating the the, the 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 versions for people with short attention spans you mentioned chet atkins when i was listening to the other versions of, of tides before i got to the evolution documentary i'm thinking to myself this sounds like Scotty Moore. Yes. Yep. You know? And right there in the evolution documentary for Tidez, you got John saying, come on, Scotty Moore. <laughs> right. Yeah. John also says, we're too buskin. Was he talking no, the, all of those are fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I like hearing a slow version of Tidez that they experimented with. There's, there's great guitar playing from Spinoza at the very end of the evolutionary one. Mm -hmm. um, there's unused pedal steel, I think you were saying before, from Sneaky Pete that's there on Tight As. Um, I like all the versions of I See Masen. They're really so close to the finished version. All right. There's that ad lib from John. Too much motorbike makes jacket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was that? In the context of that, do we know? I'm just I think it was just a non sequitur from, from John as he was wanting to do. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, that too much work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So, oh. trying to. Then there's another ad lib there from John and one day at a time. I've just got to get Ruth Buzzy out of my head before we start this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that might apply to the falsetto vocal. Is why he was talking about Ruth or. I don't know. That's not exactly who oh. I think of instantly when I hear that. No. Name. <laughs> but, but there's and one... I can think of no, no other connection. Yeah. Yoko actually says, remember it dragged a little to this song. So she's always making suggestions there. So I just find all that interesting. And the way that John would say to Jim Keltner, just keep the backbeat. That's all I care about. I love a good right. back. And there's also a lot more sax from Michael Brecker in the Evolution documentary that you have. I think the absence of it, of the sax fill at the end of the song, I, I don't, it might not even have been deliberate. It might have just been, you know, when they put the mix together, it wasn't there. I mean, you don't, um, and I haven't gone back and checked this, but I think there's some of that slide guitar at the end of Mind Games where he's, Da, 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 that isn't as apparent on a lot of these other mixes when it was such a, a important part of the song. I don't know, because when the Give Me Some Truth box set came out on Steel and Glass, they were right. saxes, so it makes you think that maybe Sean isn't crazy about saxes or horns. I don't know. I, I just wish he felt the same way about something different. Hmm. I don't feel that they added a lot to the album, yeah. except on Lucy. You know, Lucy, they're they're integral part of the song, and also uh, on the the evolution documentary of "Bring On the Lucy," he sings "Bring On the Lucy" at the very end a lot, whereas I think on the the original, you only heard it once, and that might have a longer fade as well. That yeah. one. Um, in my notes here, I put intuition. <laughs> he sings, uh, John sings, institution takes me there. Yeah. And it seems like insecticide. <laughs> right. And there's an unused sax solo at the end of intuition. And you're concentrating right now on the evolution documentary disc? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah okay. Okay. Another thing, um, I also mentioned this in Talk More Talk, but only people, they start with the demo of Sally and Billy, which originates from 1970. I've always loved the song. I never connected it with only people, but there's only like one line in there that's similar to what is in only people. But I, I kind of felt like they were reaching for that. You well, know. there's some melody and meter in, in, in that Sally and Billy demo that, that I think... Uh, he definitely invoked when he was doing only people. Hmm. It's just my interpretation of it. Okay. You never know. It's all what you hear in your ears. But uh, anything else? I know, I know. Uh, John actually ad libs. Okay, think of Mama Cass and let's go. <laughs> I wonder what's going on in his head. <laughs> Um, Did we mention that this was the first album that he would really produced on his own? I think we did. Okay. I, I... Although, you know, to me, Plastic Ono Band is mainly John, because how much did Phil Spector really do outside of playing the piano on Love? He, he, he helped with the mixes on a few tracks and was there for a couple of the sessions, but by no means was he a full-time producer on that album right. like he's credited. Ditto for Imagine. And ditto for all things must pass and living in the material world. Phil mm -hmm. made his contribution, but he wasn't truly there all of the time. Okay. Um, anything else? Um, I think touched on to everything I wrote down. Not on the evolutions. Darren, I thought you wanted to bring up. No, no, I no, I said no, not not of what I wrote down. Pretty much touched okay. on 
Yeah, just on Meat City. Um, and this is kind of important to me, having been brought up on all the, the Lost Lennon tape stuff, but the demo of Shoeshine, which is really an excellent song, which everyone, if they don't know it, should check it out. It's in great sound quality, too, with John on acoustic guitar. You, you can hear the beginnings of Meat City, and he does sing Just Gotta Get Me Some Rock and Roll. Mm -hmm. So I wish that had been in there. And the, the guitar demo in the very beginning, which sounds like the same one that was on the, the Mind Games 2002 remix as a bonus track, that's important to have in there. Um, One thing that's nice with these boxes is that they've tended to shoot around what's been available on boots and in the underground hmm. to give us something new rather than just repeating what's already out there. Although, you know, for Walls and Bridges, I have a feeling we'll probably see the whole rehearsal tape just in phenomenal quality. But, you know, it, it's been refreshing that, you know, Anthology, all of that stuff was new. There was very little duplication with boots. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yeah, it's it's great to hear anything that hasn't been bootlegged yet. But I do think in the case of Meat City, Shoe Shine is kind of essential. This mm -hmm. is my opinion. Anyway. I think a, a a seventh disc of demos would have been really good for this. If there's one, if there's one sort of lack that the set has. Um, you know, we get the one, we get bits of the demo in the evolution documentaries and we get the one uh, video demo from the Tony Cox footage of, uh, of, my, of mind game slash make love not war, but a whole disc of demos for each of these tracks, that would have been great. And like you mentioned, Chip, I promise was a prototype for mind games and it was even presented that way on the lost Lennon tapes. Right. So I'm kind of surprised that it wasn't included here. Well, I think I've mentioned this before, is that's probably one of John's worst vocal recordings ever committed to tape, is on I Promise. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry if I stepped on anybody's toes there, but he, he's all over the place on that one. So we still have raw studio mixes to go to and outtakes. Raw studio mixes is, is fun to listen to because they're just... It's the whole band, but they're they're different takes all together, and usually there's something missing in there, so it still sounds raw. Like in the case mm -hmm. of Mind Games, there's no orchestration or anything, um, and sometimes you'll hear things that you hadn't heard before. Like on Mind Games, you can hear uh, there's a reed organ that I hadn't heard before, like mm -hmm. this long note towards the very end. Um, yeah, any comments you want to make about raw studio mixes? Um, let's see. Tight ass is cool because we've got the electric guitar solo doubling the pedal steel, um, which I think I talked about further earlier. As, as Spinoza's parts were were picked up by Sneaky Pete. Um, one day. Um, you know, it's always nice to hear the electric piano pulled up on that one. And here we have all of Spinoza's licks included as well, which weren't on the on the elementals. Um, you know, all of them have something to offer, I think. Every, every one of these different mixes, there, there's something special about it that we can take from it and, and add to our knowledge of the album. One of the things I think is really special about this particular disc is that John's vocals are single tracked and yes. it makes a huge difference to me. It just feels so real and it's... it makes you realize how double tracking really fills out the sound that you maybe didn't give it credit for it before. You just took it for granted. But when you just hear one vocal line and that's it, you feel like These are... room, you know, with them. Um, um, these are kind of presented like they were, these are the basic tracks, but on several of them, there are overdubs in place. So it's not really, hmm. um, it's not really a completely stripped down version. One thing that was neat is on, I know you were able to tell that it was really a 12 string guitar that they were fumbling over, but that, that intro gave them a lot of, a lot of trouble. And that might've been why they did so many takes of it. Um, 
but yeah, the the raws are are great to hear. You can just another instrument has has been isolated here that we don't have on one of the other mixes. Hmm. Also, one of the things that I like about some of these different mixes when it comes to intuition, even though I heard these notes all the time on on the original mix, but really brings out that three note riff, da da da, da da da, you know, a lot. How you know it's all throughout the song practically, um, and this version has more sax towards the end too mm -hmm. on that. So again, one day at a time. <laughs> it's amazing god i keep bringing it up one day at a time yeah like it's, that song it's it's every version i love here <laughs> and in this case it's his voice is single track there's no harmonies at all uh there's bass guitar playing electric piano uh it's more of a feeling of intimacy and there's more sax towards the end that you didn't hear on the final mix there's always something unique about every version here. You know, every approach that uh, Sean takes on all these different discs. Alan, you want to add anything at all? Anything you want to bring up? Um, not really. I mean, pretty much what you just said, there's something on each of these tracks. It's, uh, you know, I think they're really all good selections. I like the idea of raw studio mixes, um, you know, something they've been playing with going back to the double fantasy stripped version um it's it's sort of uh it's sort of like a, a a step in the reality of the album you know this is this is what it was like before all the final production touches and extra overdubs and things went on and and that's kind of interesting to hear uh you know again as a, a step along the way sort of a um a telescoped out aspect of the evolution mixes, but focusing on one, one moment of it. Um, I, I'm glad those were included, you know, that and the, and the outtakes too, you know, with, with the outtakes, uh, there were, you know, certain ones I wrote some notes about and I like, but I, I don't know that I necessarily need to single any of them out. It's sort of just like bootlegs, you know, we're, we're, we're hearing these tracks that aren't the ones that we would necessarily put on to listen to if we want to hear the album, but if we want to hear the way to the album, mm. the outtakes and the raw studio mixes are, are, you know, important steps. True. And these days, raw takes are very much in vogue when fans yeah. or hardcore fans certainly want to hear that stuff because they've heard finished versions all these years. That's right. And people prefer more raw, less polish, you know. <laughs> so what about the outtakes? That's the last disc here. The first one I listen to. I always go to the outtakes first. <laughs> ah, you got to save your dessert for last made myself go through the rest of it out the blue i think is might be one of the highlights from the outtake disc because it, it, it's got a definite reggae vibe to it in spots courtesy of gordon huh. yeah yeah he he and he and keltner pick it up a little bit and start to start to swing but uh so that's probably one of the ones i think with the biggest variations um in comparison to the album takes um is you are here the long one? Yeah, this is take like five. Yeah, so that's the one from the uh, one from the uh, twelve inch record store day. Mm -hmm. um, Meat City is very cool. Spinoza hasn't worked everything out, but the performance is really tight, especially the drummers. Um, yeah. Um, we have some blue lyrics included. Um, yeah. And then at the very end, he goes into uh, locomotion and keep your hands yep. off my baby. And his voice sounds great singing, keep your hands off my baby. Yeah. And it's kind of neat, too, because on Meat City, you can hear that they're starting another take without finishing the first one. He goes, I'm going to I'm going to start a new one here. Or hmm. What is it that he said on that? But, uh, you know, that that can. The very end, I, I wrote down that he says. Did we get one, or are we in a right. phone? <laughs> right. The last thing on the box. 
Right. Or are we in a funk? Um, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that these sessions were uh, recorded at 30 IPS. Mm-hmm. Um, which tends to break up the sessions a lot more because you can maybe only get two or three takes onto a single reel of tape. Hmm. So, it, you know, maybe they're cooking and then oh, we got to change reels. And then the, in the time that it takes to do that, then they, they've lost the groove. Hmm. Right. But the sound quality is phenomenal as a result of it. Yeah, like Ken, I think I started with the outtakes disc first. Um, and, um, it's kind of, I don't know it, when I was, when it was all done, I just, my notes here are put down, this is just like an alternate way to listen to mind games. Ultimately, uh, it was very laid back. Um, all the songs tended to have more of a, a kind of a relaxed groove to them, except maybe, maybe meet city. Um, and what popped into my head was side two of Men Love Avenue being sort of an alternate way of listening to some of the songs from Walls and Bridges. Mm-hmm. Uh, CD6, the outtakes test of Mind Game, struck me as having that same effect on me. These are just different um, versions of these songs. They're complete enough. They could have come, many of these could have come out as the versions on the finished album. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's like the alternate mind games. That's how I ended up when it was all done looking at the uh, outtakes test. Yeah, there's a bootleg label called Pear that keeps putting yeah. out these alternate versions of, of, of solo albums and um, I think even Beatles albums and with, with outtakes. And this is a lot like one of those Pear productions, you know. <laughs> It actually it's a nice played funky version of only people. You know, it's easygoing, but it also has this sort of funky groove going that that is a bit different than the finished version. That was fun. I'm guessing here that Sean chose takes that were complete, that um, weren't fragmented or didn't break down. Um. Maybe there's one or two exceptions to that. I didn't note any, you know, that make makes it play like, all right, now here's a kind of a, a raw fly on the wall version of uh, of the entire album. With the press conference that we mentioned earlier uh, in place of the uh, international anthem. Actually, um, the version of Tight As on here. It's like the only disappointment for me because it's way too short. Mm. It's only a little bit more than two minutes. Right. It's great, great guitar work from David Spinoza on there, but, you know. Sounds like Albert Lee is what I've got here. Huh. Um, in yeah, that's another one. Things, I'm... In the scheme of things, disappointment for being too short is much better than disappointment for being crappy. <laughs> I'll go. take it. Going back to what I mentioned earlier on, the last CD in the box, the outtakes disc, is an ideal thing to listen to on its own. Uh, and if you did crunch the entire box set in one sitting, you're not going to appreciate the outtakes disc as well. That's that's an alternate, like I just said a couple of times, it's an alternate way of listening to the album and maybe go and listen to one of the older editions you have whether it be the vinyl and apple pressing or and then uh and then listen to disc six from the box set on its own uh and i think you appreciate the songs much more than trying to crunch this all in because i also found uh was it elemental is it element is it a documentary no that's element no elemental i didn't know what i was listening to after a while as i was trying you know to devour these Sometimes it gets confusing. And I confuse yeah. very easily. So, <laughs> But like most of you, I think I'd rather have as much as they're willing to give us as opposed to... to... Yeah. Okay. I mean, the only thing else I can think of is what Alan suggested. If you just had a disc of demos, but you have complete mm-hmm. demos, 
for each song. That would be really cool. You kind of reminded me, Darren, of when I used to have my radio show on WDHA in New Jersey, and we ran the Lost Lennon tapes. So I had access to a lot of those songs. Oh, and that nice. was an alternate Imagine album and an alternate Mind Game. Right. Oh, sure. heard those things. It was always exciting when listening to the Lennon tapes when the last song you needed to do that, to make that alternate album got broadcast. Like mm -hmm. I think uh Lucy might have been the last one for mind games. And I was like, all right, now we can make that disc. Yeah. But then they had the bootleg albums that came mm -hmm. out where they did didn't they do similar things like that? Like yes. Yeah. You know, that pair label I just mentioned was uh, specializes in that, I think. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, I do love that version of Meat City on Outtakes. It's really smoking, that version. I wish I could play it on the radio, but there's a bit of profanity in there. So I have to either bleep it or play you it. You can back. flip just that little, just that initial uh, bit of the, the word and, and, Get away with it, I think. Okay. Flip it around. Yep. And uh, we should also point out that sometimes in these songs, you have a different set of lyrics that John didn't end up using. Like in Mind Games, he sings, Love is the answer, it's mirrored in the wind, and love is a flower, the power grows within. Mm -hmm. And yes is the answer that's mirrored in your soul. And yes, his surrender, the messages of old. And he also hey. uses a few lines in You Are Here, from mystical to magical, what a way to fly. I didn't write the rest. <laughs> but, uh, oh, wait, I do have it here. From temple scenes to village greens, let there be light. So it's just interesting to know that very quickly he had to make these decisions and decide what is he going to put in there and what is he going to take out. So... It tells you at this time when they were recording this and they give you that those dates of August 1st through the 5th in the box set. Mm -hmm. A lot of things were decided very quickly, probably in those five days. And like you said, there was overdubbing later. Mm -hmm. All right. So the only thing we have left to discuss are those Easter eggs. So what you had on there were two different recordings of I'm the Greatest. It's kind of interesting why that was included in here. I mean, it's the same time period, but it really had nothing to do with mind games. Right. Well, it was a John composition from that period that really there was no other place where we could release that. I mean, um, and same with rock and roll people. I mean, I kind mm. of feel like those two should have had their own places, tracks 13 and 14, just like on on the Plastic Ono band box, how they, they added the singles to it at the end of each disc. Right. You know, okay. they were they were both John composition, you know, uh, rock and roll people went back to 1970 like a lot of the others. Um, and, and I'm the greatest, you know, that we don't need to recount how that got three of the four of them together for the first time mm -hmm. in the studio. Um, so I'm glad they're there. Wasn't I'm the Greatest started a little bit earlier? Wasn't that an earlier copy? I'm the Greatest was 70 as well. Yeah. Interesting. And it's nice to have the the evolutionary uh, recording of I'm the Greatest in there because you got clips of George talking and you've got Ringo talking. I haven't integrated that with the this long piece of the session tape that we have already to see what bits are duplicating what might be new hmm. okay and uh mal evans voice is in there mm -hmm. as what's the next one <laughs> can always recognize mal's voice um yeah we also have a couple of jams in there matchbox on one track and that's all right, Mama, singing into My Baby Left Me. A little too short for me, but they're still enjoyable. You know, the same way that we have them as bonus tracks, the, the 50s rock on Plastic Auto Band, you know. And of course, 11 minutes of <laughs> Elytron and slide guitar. Right. 
those were uh they rented the equipment for the overdubs they rented the the mellotron and when that showed up ken and john went out and and goofed off with it and they they were ran running a real uh, a quarter inch tape and that's what that was taken from same when sneaky pete showed up he was he was just running down stuff and you know they, they just let the tape roll so they're two real so be thankful that we didn't get the full reel of both of them <laughs> they they spared us and, and cut it down to 11 minutes i would take it yeah I, i'd take it but yeah, <laughs> that, that if we can get a, be a tough listen we have electronic sound as a full album we True. Full album of Melatron Magic. Yeah. Maybe on the 60th edition, <laughs> 60th anniversary. Mm. The uh, the Mind Games commercial video that's a, a, another Easter egg um, runs for about 10 minutes. And I have a version of that that goes for 22 minutes. So there's obviously lots of extra stuff that they can do for uh, the next edition. <laughs> 22 minutes. Unedited versions. And I don't know that the 22 minutes is all of it either. You know, it's probably not. And this is, this was different takes of the shoots of the commercial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With Tony King as uh, the queen. As the queen. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I guess that covers everything. Any final thoughts you want to say about the box set? Bring on walls and bridges. <laughs> or Is there has there been any? Do you think that will happen? On walls and bridges? No, sometime in New York City because of the inherent problem with. Uh... I, I think they're going to bust it up and 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 it issue them as parts of associated projects with with these films that are coming out. Now, I don't know that we'll see it on its own. And you think, I hope we do. Yeah. And Chip, you felt that it was the opening song, the single from the album that was the uh, sticking sticking point. How, how are you going to promote a box set where that's the lead off yeah. song and in the first line of the song? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's just John something Lennon. that. <laughs> but yeah. it's John Lennon. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't, but nowadays it would. Yeah. yeah. I also wish they would do it. <laughs> this sounds a little counterintuitive, but it's by far my least favorite John Lennon album. And these sets so far, um, and including the Beatles ones too, um, really have have provided so much information about what went into it and why he was doing what he did and how he was doing what he did that I kind of suspect that if I could have that for some time in New York city, I might end up liking it more, you know, <laughs> just because the more information you have, um, you know, or maybe not, but, um, but I, I, you know, we need it to complete the set anyway, really, you know, I mean, there's a few more albums they can do before that becomes the only one left out, but but still, they, they really should do it. That's my opinion. I would just add that, um, as I said before, this has become the template for really doing, you know, the box set the right way. Yeah. Um, and I really, as much as I love the Beatles box sets, imagine if they were given this kind of an approach and you had elemental mixes and elements oh. mixes and an evolutionary one. I mean, when you get different takes of the same song, you can see an evolution in and of itself, but to also have outtakes and raw outtakes and bonus tracks as Easter eggs. When you, when you're giving you that much stuff, there, there, there's so much to appreciate and learning the whole process of how these songs were developed and finished. And I think that, you know, Sean and all the engineers that worked on this deserve a lot of credit for this because I can, I can just feel a lot of thought was put behind everything that was done. Um, and my only complaint is this, I have a problem with remixes in general because I guess a part of me is somewhat of a purist in that it'll always be important to me that everybody starts with listening to the original mix and then from there I'll listen to the other mixes if they want to. But you should always hear it the way the artist presented it first. 
it's really sad yeah. in the case of the Beatles that you only have two of them alive right now to approve the ones that are out there. And you do have the, the Lennon camp and the Harrison camp to to represent John and George. But it's not the same thing as all four of us being all four of them being there. So, um, yeah, but overall, tremendous job. And aside from just taking out the Saxon one day at a time on the <laughs> remake, I have very few complaints. And that's, you know. I think that's pretty darn good <laughs> all right so before we go here chip you want to give us some information about the status of lenonology and oh, sure. and um, uh how you can get a copy all right uh two main books to plug here first is eight arms to hold you with with a wonderful introduction written by alan all those a long time ago uh, this is basically a uh, guide to all of uh, the solo recordings from 66 up through the year 2000. Um, it, it's gone out of print. Uh, hard copies were selling for three figures. Um, so Mark and I went through and, and updated and have made it available digitally. Um, Leninology is... Uh, planned multi-volume set about John and Yoko's life and art together. Uh, the next volume will be the albums themselves and all the recording sessions. Uh, like the books that are in the uh, box sets here, but even more detail. Um, these are both available at Leninology.com. And right now, this is the only place you can get them. So you have a target. To take a look. Target date for the second Leninology book? No, sir. When it's done, it'll it'll, it'll be done. It'll be done. So okay. That's the one nice thing about publishing it yourself. Well, make sure. So thanks to, for the legacy opportunity. Out of the way first, just get the McCartney legacy out of the way first. Yeah. <laughs> Don't interfere with that book. Mm. No, nope, no. Nope. Has to stand by itself. This thing's taken so long, it'll be a matter of whether it's done first or tune in volume two is first. <laughs> Not that long. <laughs> yeah. All right. This has been tremendous. Thank you so much for joining us, Chip. Yeah, thanks. My and, pleasure. You know, anytime you want to come back, let us know. Sure. And okay. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. you. Thanks, thanks for your again, time, Chip. Appreciate All it. All right, guys. So long. Bye bye. Well, that was just great. Chip is always a tremendous guest every time we have him here on the show. Hopefully we'll have him back again real soon. So uh, before we go, a quick roundup of what we're all doing. Darren, we'll start with you. Uh, you can catch me at WFUV Monday through Thursday nights, uh, starting at 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Um, if you're in the New York City metro area, you'll listen at 90.7 FM. Uh, that's where WFUV is located. And you can also listen online, which means you can listen anywhere, uh, WFUV.org. Plus, we have an app. So that's, uh, uh, did I mention Saturday afternoons as well? It's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4. That's when I am on the air on WFUV. And you can find me on Facebook. Two pages I have, uh, Darren DeVivo and Another page, Darren DeVivo, uh, WFUV DJ and Beatle Podcaster. So like one, friend me on the other one, and uh, and that's that. Okay, Alan, your turn. Okay, you can find me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. You can write to all three of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can write to me at alancozen at gmail.com. And we are on Twitter at, I mean, X, at, at Things We Said Fab. And of course, there's our Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast. Look for our spiffy new logo mm -hmm. on that Facebook page because the other ones are our old Facebook pages. And, you know, anyway, so there we are. Okay, as far as me, uh, very quickly, my email address, if you want to reach me, is everylittlething at att.net. You can find me on Facebook and friend, friend me at Ken Michaels. 
uh my other talk show podcast talk more talk a solo beatles video cast we just did two shows in a row on mind games with none other than chip manninger so if you can't get your fill yet of chip go check out the two shows that we did the first part was more on the history of the album the second part was on the box set and how we all all feel myself and my co-host kid o'toole joe mayo and tom Hunyadi. so plenty more mind games material between this show and talk more talk my youtube channel ken michaels radio we did three shows in a row of my new feature called the deeper you go all on ringo star and i asked my guest to name 10 deep tracks from ringo from his solo career anything but hits that are among the favorites of my guests and those guests happen to be bruce sugar Ringo's co-producer and co-songwriter and musician on many of his albums and co-producer since the Mark Hudson days. Also, speaking of Mark Hudson days, Gary Burr, who was with Ringo during the Mark Hudson period as part of the Roundheads and on many of his albums and EPs since then, including the upcoming uh, Ringo Country album. And Scott O'Rourke, who does a Beatles show called With the Beatles on WUSB on Thursdays, every other Thursday. And so they all weigh in with their favorite 10 D tracks from Ringo. Hear what they had to say. You can chime in with some of your favorites as well. And Madeline Maccaro, who I mentioned before in the show, who wrote the book on Yoko, uh, In Your Mind, The Infinite Universe of Yoko Ono. We did a show on Mind Games where we talked about Yoko's influence at the time on the album and on John. Okay, that's something else you can check out for my radio show, Every Little Thing. If you want to catch it, the easiest way to do so is to go to WFDU's website. That's Fairly Dickinson University's website, WFDU.FM. Go to their archival pages, type in Every Little Thing, and you'll get the last two week shows that they've been running on the radio station, and each show runs for two weeks. Okay, um, and my website, kenmichaelsradio.com. Check out the Beatles trivia on there. And I do have new prizes that I'm offering uh, as one of 10 great prizes, including Gary Burr's brand new book called Reunion. All uh, It's a fan fiction book about an imaginary concert uh, in 1998. Uh, the story goes, John Lennon never was murdered. That never really happened. And when Linda died, the four Beatles decided to get together as a tribute to Linda. Paul got the other three to do that. So it's the story behind that, if you want to check that out. And um, also we have the revised edition of All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton and Other Assorted Love Songs by Ken Walmack and Jason Krupa. It has an, a, a new chapter in there, all concerning the album All Things Must Pass taking you day by day as to what songs were recorded and who played on each okay. song. So if you want to know, because all these years, if you picked up All Things Must Pass, it listed all the musicians, but it didn't specify what songs they were on, check out that book. Because it comes from Mal Evans' own notes, which Ken Womack was able to uh, read through all of his research and doing what will be two books on Mal Evans. All right, and that's it for me. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this. Please write to us here at Things We Said Today, radio show at gmail.com if you have any ideas for our shows. Um, and for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, I'm Ken Michael saying, too much motorbike makes John a double. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye.